Welcome to Heliotropes. My name's Julia. And my name's Kojo. Today we're, you know, talking about Juneteenth. Woo! And, um, you know, it was last Friday, June 19th, 2020. We're talking about that. We're going to go over a little history of that. Um, also, Happy Father's Day and Fathering yeah. Day to all the, uh, the fathers and the people who are doing fathering. Um... We're not talking about the history of that. Talking about Juneteenth, we're going to dispel some of the myths around Juneteenth and the broader myths around the Emancipation Proclamation. We're going to go into why those myths persist, what they mean, what the reality of the situation is. And then we're going to talk about a concept developed by a um, scholar of African American history, Derek Bell, concept being interest convergence, right? And we're going to talk about how that factors in really consistently with um, the ideas of Juneteenth and the abolition of slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation and all the stuff that entails. Mm -hmm. And if we do it well, we'll be drawing parallels to from um, the Emancipation Proclamation and its outcomes, um, some of the things Kojo just mentioned, and some of the things that are happening today. Boom. Past and present. So without further ado, we're going to, you know, Here's some exposition. Right, so everyone knows, you know, I, I guess part of the reason is that everyone doesn't know. Yeah, part of the reason yeah, that okay. we're doing this. Um, we found out, you know, like, Juneteenth has been on my radar. I can't even say all my life, but, you know, for the past few years, it's been on my radar. Um, I don't know how long it's been on your radar. Yeah, similarly for a few years, but it wasn't something that I ever learned about in school right. or from my family right. um, or anything like that. Likewise, never learned about it from school. Definitely not. And, you know, yeah, definitely not from family. Definitely an internet and friends thing. Um, but, I mean, we've known about it. And a lot of people uh, around us are just finding out about it. If they didn't find out about it last week, they're going to find out about it in a year. So you can send this video to your friends, family, whatever. So, one, they know about it before, you know, it comes around. And, two, they actually know about it. And they know a little bit about the uh, circumstances behind it. So the narrative, we're starting with the narrative, right? And, you know, again, distinguishing between um, narratives and, like, historical realities. We're not saying that the reality is all there is to it, but the narrative was designed to shape a certain story, a certain mindset, and we're, uh, we're challenging that narrative. So the narrative of Juneteenth is that it celebrates the day that the last enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, received news of their freedom from a Union general on June 19th, 1865. Um, for those who know, again, this is part of the narrative, that came two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed into effect by Abraham Lincoln. And again, as you know, part of the narrative, the Emancipation Proclamation had uh, was designed to free all the slaves. So that's the narrative. Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation. He frees all the slaves in January 1863. And then two and a half years later, the last people to hear about it in Galveston, Texas, um, are freed. And, you know, on June 19th, because that's when they got word of it. And there's a lot of, there are a couple of different narratives around what happened and why it took so long. Um, there are some thoughts, I think like a pretty common thought might be that um, like, you know, Texas is so far away right. and that for people to finally show up that it took a really long time to get there. There's another narrative that the person who was supposed to deliver the message was shot on the way there. And then of course, there's a much more uh, accurate message around the enslavers in Texas wanting to maintain slavery for their own economic benefit. And there's, Texas it, um, was in an interesting kind of like political context uh, at that time in space. So they were originally, um, I mean, Texas was part of Mexico and seceded from Mexico. Mexico abolished slavery I think in the 1820s. Texas seceded from Mexico in 1836. Um, and the Union did not want to accept Texas into the United States because they didn't want to accept another slave state into the nation. Texas became an independent republic. Um, and they, like, there's a question about how much, um, 
kind of like rule and regulation the United States government at that time had over Texas because of their um, independent status, even when they became part of the United States. There were border disputes. There were, and you know, I think it's important to note as well that like the abolition movement here in the States up until even that point, until 1836, was gaining steam. It was gaining momentum, especially, obviously, in the North. Um, a lot of prominent literary, you know, people like Mark Twain. Uh, actually, you know, I don't know that he was part of it, but he was definitely part of that tradition of um, recognizing Enlightenment ideals. So the abolition movement ha would have reasonably gained enough steam to prevent Congress from... Um, welcoming Texas into the Union on the basis of, you know, their uh, insistence on slavery. Yeah. And eventually Texas was annexed into the United States during the Mexican-American War in which, you know, the U.S. did its typical thing and took over like a third of Mexican territory at that time for their, um, what do you call it? Not the divine right. Whatever it is, destiny. yeah, their manifest destiny to expand yeah. all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Right. Um, so Texas eventually became annexed into the United States and s became part of the Confederacy, but still like um, was so far westward for the U.S. to have potentially like actual kind of legal control over what was happening. Right. So we get into uh, the more realistic interpretations of events around Juneteenth. Uh, and that's a nice, really nice segue. Important to keep in mind that, you know, we don't think about, I mean, we tend to have really compartmentalized understandings of history and even like the history of states in this country, you know, and Texas played a really important role, right, in the, uh, in the whole thing. And... I don't know if this is too early to mention in terms of where you're going since you just mentioned it was a good segue. But there is also, um, in 1865, right, there's also this consideration that Texas was trying to rejoin Mexico at that time. So Mexico abolished slavery earlier than the U.S., obviously, and was under um, rule of an indigenous person of African descent in Mexico. And that shifted and changed. And then... The I mean, they put in Maximilian, the French folks, put in Maximilian, France did. And so then, and Maximilian was much friendlier to slavery. So there was a thought, too, that Texas was trying to uh, rejoin Mexico to maintain their slave state in 1865, um, which could also be part of the narrative in terms of uh, them not sharing. And when I say them, like the enslavers who were just fighting, you know, in the Civil War for the Confederacy, returning from war and not sharing the information that they had lost and what the Emancipation Proclamation meant, um, and that the enslaved folks there uh, were no longer enslaved. So getting into, you know, what the Emancipation Proclamation actually meant, and what Juneteenth is... Um, one, it's true, it does celebrate that event in Galveston, Texas on June 19th, 1865. Um, everything else, you know, begs further consideration. People in the South may not have been legally enslaved after the Civil War ended, but there were still plantation owners who had not conceded defeat nor recognized the freedom of their enslaved uh, people. Um, so that's super important to consider, right? It's not necessarily that slave, right? It's not like Juneteenth happened and then slavery didn't exist anywhere. The myth, another myth, is that uh, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, was the great emancipator. Uh, that's not accurate for a lot of reasons. Um, and, you know, that's how he's referred to in history books. It's really, yeah. it's something. Um, so, you know, on Lincoln... One, he was racist, certainly by today's standards. <laughs> yeah. And even though he ran on a platform of not expanding slavery into the Western territories that the United States had acquired, you know, again, there was um, still all of this land from the Louisiana Purchase that the United States was conquered or, you know, settling. There were these recent acquisitions, like Julia just mentioned, from the Mexican American War. Um, which included California and the huge territory of New Mexico, Arizona, like Colorado, Utah, the Southwest as we know it today, Arizona. Um, so, right, obviously 
plantation owners, the Southern Democrats in large part, were in favor of expanding slavery, right? You expand more slavery, you get more slaves, you expand your operations, it's economically, you know, whatever. It was in their self-interest to be able to expand West. Lincoln was opposed to that. He was opposed to the institution of slavery. Um, so that's you know important to note. But even though, again, he expanded West, he opposed westward expansion of slavery, he had no explicit intention of abolishing slavery where it already existed in the South and in the North. Because don't forget, slavery existed in Northern mm -hmm. states at this time. Um, <clears throat> And he even subscribed to the notion of scientific racism and its thesis of white racial superiority, right? So when I say he's racist, that's what I mean, right? He wasn't like, oh, yeah, let's enslave all African people. But he was like, I mean, the United States is uh, not a place for African people. Let's, oh, okay, so. I think it's important to clarify in terms of was against like the institution of slavery. Yeah. He was against expanding it, but clearly because he didn't want to end it was not against, per yeah. se, the institution of it. I wouldn't necessarily say that because I think, I mean, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> okay. But, you know, two central elements of his, this is just bonus news trivia for you. Two central elements of his uh, post-abolition plan, what he planned to do after the abolition of slavery uh, in the emancipation era were to, one, send formerly enslaved Af uh, African people back to Africa. You know, hence um, Liberia was founded, again, growing abolition movement in the United States. Liberia was founded by American abolitionists in 1816 um, to give African people a place to be free, essentially. Liberia, you know, liberate, liberty. And it wasn't until February... Uh, 1862, a year before he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, that the United States officially recognized Liberia as a state. So, one, his plan was to not grant equality or anything to African people, but to deport African people. And then two, um, he wanted to compensate former slave owners for the value lost by humanizing their, you know, former enslaved people. Um, and, you know, we can get into the the, the details of that uh, later on. It didn't end up happening, but it could have been a, a sound call. Um, African people, enslaved African people, so here's another uh, reality. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation presumes, or rather glorification of it, presumes that it took that in order for people, African people, enslaved people, to be freed. Mm -hmm. The reality is, Long before this happened, decades, right, for the existence of slavery, um, African people had been taking their fate into their own hands and trying to escape. And especially at the start of the Civil War, as people were hearing, one, as like, you know, yeah, people caught wind, uh, enslaved people caught wind of a war being fought against the South over, you know, slavery, um, that, I mean, they caught wind of this war and they're like, oh, <laughs> it's time to go. And also you keep in mind that the personnel demands of war, especially in the South, um, really presumed, I mean, I guess it, necess it, necess uh, it necessitated, yeah, it necessitated um, that a lot of able-bodied men who would otherwise be running operations on these plantations were now going to war, right? So enslaved people on these plantations also catch wind of that and they're like, oh, okay, you know, now's our time mm -hmm. so from at the very least the outset of the war up until you know the two years later when lincoln decided to take action as far as the emancipation proclamation african people were freeing themselves and running um fleeing to the north for freedom fleeing to the north to join the union army and fight against the south and also fleeing to mexico right because that whole situation got something in my eyes mm -hmm. um I think that's really important to point out too because one of the ideas around the Emancipation Proclamation is, wow, like Abraham Lincoln was this such a wonderful moral character and um, he did this out of, you know, like a desire for humanity and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right. When and you could make yeah. people had been doing that themselves and there's plenty of evidence to suggest that wasn't 
at all the reason he was doing it. Right. And that's the big thing is that, yeah, people were doing this themselves. He actually, and we'll get into that as well soon, how uh, essentially meaningless the emancipation was. But it was nice and symbolic, much like Obama is. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> so, another myth that we need to dispel, like, right here now, is this idea that the Emancipation Proclamation freed all slaves, right, in the United States. One, and two, or it's two things. The Emancipation Proclamation only applied to enslaved people in the Confederacy. The two things with that uh, is that one, you know, this means that every slave or enslaved person, that slavery was still legally permissible in the northern United or northern states who remained loyal to the Union. Okay, so one, in the Union where the jurisdiction of Union law took precedent there was no abolition of slavery. People were still enslaved. Two, the Confederacy, having itself seceded from the Union, was not beholden to the laws of the Union in any capacity. And they knew that, except as it involved Union encroachment on Southern territory following military victories or defeats, respectively. Um, so the only way for the Union to impose any sort of laws on the South on the Confederacy was through military conquest. Um, so, you know, it's like if, you know, we have a set of house rules and we decide to go next door, not even go next door, we decide to impose house rules, our house rules on another person's house. I mean, our, we don't have any jurisdiction, right? Especially if they've separated aggressively from our house, <laughs> you know? So the idea, all right, anyway, thus, the Emancipation Proclamation was largely rhetorical and symbolic. Important for boosting the morale of the Union Army, but largely empty as far as actively freeing any enslaved people. Furthermore, the events around emancipation um, from enslaved people freeing themselves and fighting alongside the army to the rhetorical nature of the edict to Lincoln's own commitment to preserving the institution of slavery on the campaign trail highlight the extent to which emancipation was a secondary concern and practical afterthought to the more express or pressing idea of preserving the union. Um, and we'll get into, you know, his own words pretty soon. But um, long story short, this notion of Lincoln and other historic white saviors as benevolent benefactors um, of justice is addressed by the scholar Derek Bell in the concept of interest convergence covenants. The interest convergence covenant essentially says that, quote, black rights are recognized and protected when and only so long as policymakers perceive that such advances will further interests that are their primary concerns. For example, um, Bell argues that the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision was motivated um, not by a sense of justice, but by an impetus to gain an upper hand in the fight against communism, both domestically and abroad, right? That's a relatively modern example. But the events uh, preceding and immediately preceding and succeeding the Civil War also provide really great context for understanding what that is. All right, so an example beyond the Brown versus Board of Education of the interest convergence phenomenon is the abolition of slavery in the Northern states. So even though the Northern states were um, heavily involved in slavery at different periods in the country, their economy was not significantly dependent upon um, slave labor. And so as a result of that, um, different ideas and beliefs were able to take precedence among in the northern states, included revolutionary idealism, which we should note as like wanting to think very highly of themselves and in their values of being revolutionaries, a fear of insurrection, um, and a desire for physical and racial distancing. And we've talked a little bit about this before. I think we mentioned the saying a couple episodes ago maybe, yeah. that in the South, um, whites didn't mind how close they lived to black people as long as those black people didn't get too high up in society. And in the North, it's the opposite. They didn't care how um, 
yeah, <laughs> black know. people got as long as they didn't get too close to them. Right. Um, and so the North was careful to maintain a distinction between constitutional rights to life and liberty and social and political equality, which we're going to talk a little bit more about and some parallels to um, current day as well. Right. And there's a really nice quote in here from um, Alexis de Tocqueville, de Tocqueville, who is the French political scientist who, um, he was a big deal. He came over um, around in the post-revolutionary era to you know, study the rise of democracy in the United States. And he has this quote, in the United States, people abolish slavery for the sake, not of the Negroes, but of the white men, end quote. Which is just a really, uh, you, know, you know, as far as those revolutionary ideals and wanting to like overtly express their commitment to enlightenment concepts of like equality of people, um, in practice, they, you know, it fell short, right? Like, even if you're doing the right thing, if you're doing it for, like, the way wrong reason, it ob I mean, it just ends up in a situation like you still have today, you know? Like, race is still a huge issue. Right. And part of that, too, manifests, right, in the distinction between the constitutional rights and then the practicality of how those were actually informed and manifested right. and actually didn't manifest in um, the social and political inequality that right. continued to manifest. So now we get into the Emancipation Proclamation, which as we mentioned earlier, is a prime example of this interest convergence phenomenon. Um, one of the things that Bell does in his book, actually, which we'll link below, it's called Silent Covenants, um, is he cites this letter to Abraham Link, uh, that Abraham Lincoln wrote in August on August 2nd, 1862, to Horace Greeley, and this is one of those things that we definitely studied in school, I remember his name from school, who at the time was the editor of the New York Tribune, which was a big time magazine, um, LOL, you know, big time, New York Times, New York Tribune, in which uh, Lincoln explicitly states his commitment in the war is to preserve the Union and not to issues of slavery on either side of the argument. And just quick backstory here. As we said, again, the abolition movement, especially once the war took off, uh, there were a lot of abolitionists, a lot of different types of abolitionists, right? Compensationalist abolitionists, non-compensation abolitionists, as in, you know, people saying, hey, we should free slaves and compensate the slave owners. People saying, hey, we should free slaves and not compensate the slave owners. Um... A lot of these people, and keep in mind, a lot of them owned like major media outlets. So Horace Greeley was kind of like um, mediating. I mean, not even mediating. He was like, he was pretty much like, oh, Abraham Lincoln, why are you messing around? You know, why don't you just free all the slaves? Or because you said you don't like slavery already, you know, like, why don't you just do it? Um, and he was the voice, Greeley, of a lot of abolitionists who were calling for that call, right? Like, hey, and this gets into another, you know, issue um, that we'll get into in a bit. But this was Lincoln's response. And that, again, will be linked below. It's really short. Um, and this is kind of like a core of it. But it's interesting, even in its brevity, what he says. Um, so he says, Lincoln, in this letter, quote, My paramount object in the struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. Abraham Lincoln. Um, so, again... He didn't do either. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't technically do either. <laughs> um, and it brings, you know, as Julia mentioned earlier, like a, that really interesting question of like... Um, this conflict of interest, right? Personally, he felt opposed to the institution of slavery. And he was vocal enough about it that a lot of Southern leaders assumed that if he was to become president, that the move would be for them to secede because he would abolish slavery. Um, and on the other hand, he was committed to his position as the president of the United States to preserve the union. Um, which manifested 
as he saw it in not abolishing slavery because if I go and abolish slavery is the you know that's not going to help um, the you know they've already seceded so that would you know give me no chance and keep in mind again this is late 1862 it's a few months like five months away before he signs the Emancipation Proclamation um, and then you know before we get into this next thing there's a really important here about like narratives around the Civil War. You know, a lot of people like to point out that uh, it's correct to say that the Civil War was a war fought over slavery. And that's not true, right? Both sides were fighting for different things, right? The South fought to preserve slavery. Definitely. That is true. And, you know, their enslaving way of life. When they say, oh, we're fighting for our way of life. It was like a way of life that hinged on their slavery. Heritage. Right. Their Confederate flag heritage. Right. Which hinged on slavery or, you know, like proximity to institutions which depended on slavery. Um, they fought for the state's rights to slavery. Um, while the North, on the other hand, was not fighting to free slaves. The North was not fighting to abolish slavery. The North entered the war and exited the war with the express purpose of preserving the Union. Um... And that was at its highest levels, as we just saw in that letter from Lincoln. At the highest levels, the goal was not to free enslaved people. It was to preserve the Union. Mm -hmm. um, and they were leadership pr prepared to leverage the issue of slavery in whatever direction it took to win the war. So again, back to Lincoln's words. If he could do it without freeing any slaves, he would. If he could do it by freeing all the slaves, he would. And he goes on to say... If I can do it by freeing some and not freeing others, which is what he um, still didn't do since he didn't free any, but like what he, you know, that's the closest to being accurate, he would have done that. So this is an important place to recognize and underscore that the Emancipation Procl Proclamation was a war strategy. It was never based out of a pure... Um, like value of humanity perspective or idealism or um, I don't know, humanity, I suppose, in general, or a desire to end slavery because of how, um, how unjust it was and how individuals were treating other individuals. So it really was a war strategy, right? And there was a, before he signed the proc proclamation a statement to like uh join the union or i'm signing this proclamation and that's going to devastate your economy and your way of life and change all these things and then the confederacy was kind of like mm, fuck that i'm not doing it right and then the pro proclamation was signed um and that's really important because people glorify lincoln right you go to dc and there's a lincoln memorial and everyone loves it and he's always talked about as the great emancipator and he signed the emancipation proclamation and that was the end of slavery and that's not true he signed it to maintain a union and he had his own ideas behind it and it's kind of an interesting question to think about like what he thought would come after that like what his legacy right. would be around that right. um but it was a war strategy it was that's not right. based yeah in humanity yeah the Union wasn't doing too well in the war leading up to the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Death tolls were really high. The cost of doing business or the cost of doing war was increasingly high for both sides. But like the South was way more invested in fighting the war, right? And they had won a lot of really pivotal battles leading up to that point. So it kind of became like a situation where like, oh, you know. Right, like that's how you know it wasn't just like a random military tactic, it was calculated. It was like we need to do everything we can, right? Mm -hmm. Last ditch efforts to win this war. Yeah, in so, fact, he waited right. to sign it until the Union had won Atlanta, yeah, yeah, a pivotal battle to increase their morale and to feel like they had to take some momentum, yeah, yeah. And there was also you know, it wasn't even just like an American affair. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier. You yeah. know, there was the threat. The no it was a threat for the North of mm -hmm. foreign participation. European. Right. Yeah. European participation. Intervention in the war on behalf of, behalf of the South. Mm -hmm. And it's not, right, like 
European intervention from Mexico, right? Like right. from the colonizers right. who are close by, not, you know, on the other side right. of the ocean. So it was like, okay, you know, that was part of the time right. thing as well, right? Not only do we need to make sure that we're winning some decisive battles, but we need to do something big to disrupt the southern economy and war effort before they get all of these um, allies yeah. on board. And get soldiers. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the fuller context in which the Emancipation Proclamation fits in. And, you know, um, I mean, you know, that's it. And one <laughs> <laughs> final uh, thing before we get into our, you know, conversation discussion piece um, is that Bell notes that emancipation was, of course, celebrated by a lot of, um, by everyone who was freed. And... You know, I think it's funny. He says that, you know, somewhat inaccurately, like people did see it as freedom. And, you know, it was good on the one hand because black freedom was a, quote, fortuitous dividend of a policy adopted for other reasons, end quote, right? Like in the sake of preserving the union, uh, African people were granted freedom. That's good that they were granted freedom. But... You know, as we'll get to really shortly, it begs the question of if we don't look at the fuller context, if we don't look at why people were granted freedom, then I mean, we've talked about this in previous podcasts, it's going to it perpetuates this idea that freedom is kind of inevitable. You know, freedom is uh, it's just a matter of progress. We just have to wait around long enough and then eventually something's going to happen and we're going to be free. When in fact, you look at the history events such as this and freedom is um, not only intimately connected to the interests of the oppressors, but it's, I mean, so we'll, we'll get into this stuff. Mm-hmm. So there's three points that we're going to consider right now. Three points that Bell makes on the issue of interest convergence and around emancipation. The first point, and, you know, these, each of these will be like points of discussion. Quote, blacks obtain relief even for acknowledged racial injustice, only when that relief also serves directly or indirectly to further ends which policymakers perceive are in the best interests of the country. End quote. So that's essentially the thesis of interest convergence repeated, right? Um, and you know, you know, as far as conversation is concerned, we can see we can connect that through certain events. You know, it's also important to note, he says, this isn't how history goes, like, all the time. This isn't the only way to look at the gains that black people have um, made or been granted. But it's a significant one. You know, when you look at the major events of black liberation in the United States. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I was just listening to you and also reading that and thinking about... um the constitutional amendments following the Civil War, right. right, and the 13th Amendment, and abolishing slavery. So that's in case you were wondering how uh, all slavery was abolished in the country is through the 13th Amendment, right. except in the case um, for punishment for crime, right. which then started the like convict leasing program in which um, black individuals were, you know, profiled, arrested. Um, for like really minor infractions and then were leased out in some cases to go and work on the plantation which they where they were formerly enslaved right and thinking about how that has evolved into the prison industrial complex and I mean I'm not sure if people knew that that was going to kind of expand in the way that it has expanded now but thinking about right like obtaining relief even for acknowledged racial injustice, right? So abolishing slavery, um, when that relief serves directly or indirectly to further ends, which policymakers perceive are in the best interest of the country, right? So now the prison industrial complex makes a lot of money for people in power and also keeps criminals off the streets, right? Which is this, like law and order is a really significant narrative in our political processes here. And that can be traced I mean, as I just back. mentioned, yeah, all the way back. Yeah. And I think, I mean, it begs a really interesting question of, um, you know, again, like you said, you know, for 
the part that really gets me is acknowledged racial injustice, right? So the point here is that it's not like a new thing, like, oh, you know, suddenly people were like, oh, slavery is wrong. Let's, you know, abolish it. It was like people have been saying this thing for decades, right? For hundreds of years, really. And now we decide to listen to them. Except in this case, it was in the interest of the Union only at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives, right? I think the Civil War, like 700,000 Americans. Well, I mean, I guess it depends. Yeah, post-Civil War. 700,000 Americans ultimately lost their lives, um, died for the cause of the Civil War on either side of the conflict, right? So it's the bloodiest conflict that America has engaged in for Americans, and the fact that that's the kind of you know conflagration that we waited for in order to do something about it, the issue of slavery mm-hmm. is kind of wild, you know. Like it makes you think of you know all the things that we could be doing now in order to like in the name of justice, right? In the name of altruism, in the name of humanity, and like these enlightenment ideals to um, put ourselves in a better situation position in the future that we're not doing. Right, because it doesn't benefit someone. But when we think again about like what it takes for someone to realize, oh, now this benefits us, that can include a war, right? It can include um, war again, right? Because we go back to the Cold War, fast forward to Brown versus Board of Education and the rights that uh, followed a decade later, the Supreme Court victories, the legislative victories that followed, the federal executive victories. In the 64 and 65 uh, Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, Mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff, the major impetus behind it was to not only suppress domestic dissension, opposition to like the Vietnam War, but a broader sense that we need as many hands on deck as we can get in order to win over the communists Mm -hmm. in the uh, Cold War. So like in both of these significant occasions, it took war. Literal, well, you know, the Cold War wasn't a literal war, but it was, there were a bunch of proxy yeah. wars. Um, so it took that, like, thing in order for people to be like, oh, yes, this is, um, <laughs> it's now in our interest to do what's in their interests. Versus this idea of, like, an enlightened self-interest in which everyone can just see now that if everyone's situation was better... Or rather, if the situations of the people at the bottom were that much more better, were that much better, <laughs> then everyone's situation would be better, right? right? If we invested in Medicare for all, right? Mm-hmm. Right now, instead of waiting for a catastrophe, which has arguably already happened, if we invested in you know absolving people of their student loan debts, right? Especially students, but really, you know, just like invested in getting rid of debt in general. Well, okay, I'm not going to say all that because that might not be a good idea, but absolving people of their student loan debt, they would actually be able to take their expertise that they invested in and like put it towards generating, you know, growth. It's just one of those things, you know. Yeah, and this is truly a bipartisan thing too. And I, you know, because people I think often think, oh, well, that's just like the conservatives and the ultra conservatives or the racists. And like, that's just not the case. Um, When you think about uh, different folks who have supported when you think about um, different folks who have supported and voted for wars, who have voted against advancing, um, you know, whatever it is, like rights and, and equity for different populations. Um, yeah, we don't need to expand much further on that, but this covers everybody from uh, every political standpoint. Right. Well, most people from every political standpoint. The second point here um, on along the lines of interest convergence is that, quote, blacks as well as their white allies are likely to focus with gratitude on the relief obtained. Little attention is paid to the self-interest factors without which no relief might have been gained. You know, and that is to say, uh, you know, again, like I said earlier, um, these things happen and we tend to focus only on the good things. We, are, we tend to focus on the results versus looking at the broader picture and saying, okay, how did we get those results and how is that process of coming to this certain result or conclusion problematic 
or beneficial. Um, so in this case, right, like it's, hey, we got freedom finally. And instead of reflecting and being like, hey, what did it take to get that freedom? You know, it's like, oh, no, I mean, we just have freedom. And that means not looking at the rest of the circumstances around us, right? Not looking at how that freedom, nominal freedom, quickly transformed into sharecropping, into conflict mm. lease, into, you know, Jim Crow, into the black codes, into all of these things. And then, like, again, since we don't look at the core of these things, since we only look at the results, the Civil Rights comes, Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, 1960s come, and we only look at the results there, right? We don't look at, oh, what was the depth of what Martin Luther King was saying, you know, as far as mm-hmm. being involved economically? What were the depths of what, like, Malcolm X was saying as far as, um, you know, self-determination? What were the depths of what you know, even James Baldwin was saying as far as, like, race being a construct that is divisive and destructive and dangerous, right? We don't look at these things and say, oh, like, um, you know, how do we get these results? We just say, oh, look at these results. And then that leaves us incapable of observing the realities that lead us into the mass incarceration era and, like, you know, all these other things. Yeah, and I think, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation fits in really nicely here, right? Because yeah. what that has done, as Kojo described at the beginning, is created this, like, glorifying narrative about Abraham Lincoln and the... Uh, Union versus the Confederacy, right? And like this divide between the North and the South that very much still exists with the North thinking the people who live in the South are a bunch of racists and like feeling like quite entitled that, you know, they aren't racist because, you know, slavery uh, happened in the South and not in the North. Um, And I think what it does in a lot of ways, right, especially for, quote, white allies, is to whitewash history, You know, it's when white people start pulling out the Dr. King quotes that are, um, you know, that feel that are palatable for them instead of recognizing that uh, Dr. King had the poor people's campaign. Right. And was against capitalism and um, was fighting for, you know, like living wages and health care and better standards of living and all these different things in and calling out white moderates and white liberals, yeah. right? And like yeah. doing all these things, but instead they choose to pull like the color blindness quote from the I have a dream speech to be like, oh yeah, he was so great and we have the same values, so I'm aligned uh, there. And I think you're right, like that really diminishes all of the work and all of the effort and all the organizing effects. And oftentimes the people who are behind those things are black women. Right. And that relegates them right like into dark corners of history right yeah almost the virtual obscurity you know like even when i was you know malcolm x martin luther king james baldwin also fannie lou hamer you know like shirley chisholm uh ida b wells Wells. well i mean i'm talking about like 1960s okay yeah but she's worth a shout out yeah yeah she's always worth a shout out yeah shout out ida b wells Mm -hmm. be well ancestor And black trans women, right? Like, it's a way for things to be, uh, for history to be co-opted. And I think that serves likely different purposes for um, black people and white people. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. The third piece um, is that, quote, the remedy for blacks appropriately viewed as a good deal by policymaking whites often provides benefits for blacks that are more symbolic than substantive. But, whether substantive or not, they are often perceived by working class whites as both an unearned gift and a betrayal. End quote. So, um, yeah. I mean, oftentimes, the people who are making the policies, again, they just come in, they're like, hey, you know, here's this thing that doesn't really do you any good. Again, the Emancipation Proclamation in this case, it doesn't, you know, we're not going to free, you know, northern uh, people who are enslaved on northern plantations. um, And we're just going to vocalize our descent of southern um, enslavement because we're at war with them and because we want them to come back. But we're, you know, we recognize that our voice actually has no impact on what they do. We just need to go in there and beat them up until, you know, we can 
bring them back in. Tough love, you know? Mm-hmm. And then that results again in the whole like sub uh, symbolic stuff, right? Like freedom is acquired, but you, you practice that freedom on sharecropping plantations and in convict lease programs. Um, and these are considered right. The rights, right? Nominal rights, nominal 13th, 14th, 15th amendment, you know, granted rights without actual like significant implementation of those right. rights or defense of those rights or anything and why people get upset <laughs> yeah. i think a really um striking parallel that we were talking about before before we started recording is that um the parallels following um abolition and uh prison release right. so like re-entering um, which is the uh, like a uh, um, abolition, right? And this, there's no setup for formerly enslaved folks, right? There's no money, there's no land, there's no like direction kind of to go in, right? Like people are starting with um, maybe like other people and relationships and like you know their spirit and their values. Um, but as we know in this country, that doesn't necessarily get you very far in terms of being able to live and to survive. And then when we think about, um, how, uh, folks currently are released from the prison system, right? Like we know that tons of companies in this country use prison labor to create their products and, and firefighters in the state of California, but they get paid pennies, right? And so as they're released from prison, unless they have significant family support and money, which many of them don't, otherwise they wouldn't be there in the first place because they would have been able, right, like to pay for bail and to not have to take a shitty plea bargain that landed them in prison in the first place. Um, They're starting at a significant deficit. And depending on what the charge is, right, that's they, one, maybe not be able to vote. They might not be able to get housing. They, it is going to be much more difficult to get a job. They may not have anywhere to live, right? And um, it's like this really striking parallel about uh, like prison reform, right? Or like letting folks out. And, and I mean, like, I think prisons should be abolished, right? But there's no like forward thinking around that, right? The idea is, oh, well, like, we abolished slavery, like, look how great we did, without any plan about, um, like, helping folks rebuild lives that you have permanently fucked up, right? And that's not even, where I'm not even touching on the emotional trauma and the emotional piece around that. And the same thing about, like, releasing prisoners who are essentially, right, like, in our country right now, enslaved individuals. Right. Um, and there's no forethought around that either, including as I mentioned before, like the emotional trauma um, that has come with it. And then there's also always like the white backlash to consider with these things and how, um, how, yeah, I mean, I just, I think that's one of the important pieces to consider in this, Mm -hmm. um, this particular piece is how whites respond, white people respond to uh, the perception of advancement, right? We've covered in previous podcasts, like the concept of white rage, you know, how like white communities respond to black ambition, Mm -hmm. to black progress, and like what it means, and this is something you were mentioning, you know, beforehand, like how interesting it is, the historical parallels in the sense, um, these narratives that like, Oh, uh, you know, these people are coming to take our jobs or these, right. the, the progress of this disenfranchised group of people or recently enfranchised group of people inhibits, like encroaches, interferes with uh, my own ability to achieve, mm-hmm. right? And that, because, you know, we think about emancipation and like the backlash after that, it's yeah. like, oh, okay. The like, clan. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, yeah. terrorist organizations formed as a response to again like democratic efforts right granting people the right to vote granting people representation 
granting people um, the ability to like have self-determination on par with you Mm -hmm. regardless of who you are if you're um yeah i mean in this country if you're white then that's what it is it's a democratizing effort right like if we live in a democracy and if you value the fact that we live in a democracy or at least you value the idea of like what democracy actually is you have to appreciate that People getting rights, especially citizens getting rights, right? And I'm not saying, you know, putting any personal emphasis on citizenship or not, but there are a lot of people who do put that emphasis out there. And, you know, right. like if you're one of those people, you've got to understand that citizens having more rights, just like you do, is democracy, you know? Mm-hmm. And the fact of, right, like what we're saying here essentially is that one, <sighs> like w- people are having to fight way too hard in a historical context to receive like the bare minimum of what this country promises its citizens, right? Mm-hmm. Promises people, not even citizens, right? We the people find these truths to be self-evident, right? Blah, blah, blah. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say citizens, right? That's the Declaration of Independence. There was no citizen of the United States yet. That's a constitutional thing. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are human rights in the Declaration of Independence, right? And then you get into the Constitution and like things that citizens are uh, guaranteed. People shouldn't have to fight for those things, right? Black men getting shot in the street by the cops should not have to continue to fight for the right to life, right? Again, bare minimum. Children being put in cages at the border should not have to fight for liberty, right? As a human right, right? It doesn't matter whether or not they're a citizen. They shouldn't have to fight for these things. All the things we're fighting for now, right? Indigenous people in this country should not have to fight for the ability to live on their land, right? They should not have to fight for their land to be um, like ecologically sound, you know, they shouldn't have to fight for the right to live in land that doesn't have oil spills, yeah. you know, consume water Red that's not... going yeah. through it, which the Supreme Court just okayed again last week. Right, across the Appalachian. Appalachian. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, all of these things. So one, people are having to fight way too hard for the bare minimum because we already know what's right and we've already recognized that if we let... I mean, because that's essentially what happens. Right? The founding fathers knew that slavery was an issue and they contended amongst themselves and ultimately settled on not addressing it, letting someone else address it in the future. Right? They put off the problem. And since they put the problem off, it culminated in a war. And that's what it took for people to feel self-invested, self-interested in abolishing slavery. Right? But if we just address it at the beginning, yeah, it would have been uncomfortable. Yeah, there would have been people who would have been upset and maybe, you know... Um, there would have been some disunion or whatever. But also, you know, it wouldn't have culminated in this war, right? Um, And not even to say that, like, it had to be addressed in 1776 or in 1863. It could have been addressed addressed at any time in between that. And maybe a war would have happened eventually. Maybe it would have happened sooner. But it might have been as... might not have been as bad, you know? Like, and... You just never know. If you listen to the right people, war doesn't even need to happen, you know. Um, and it still hasn't really been addressed, which is also right, right like kind of striking about these uh, three points on the interest convergence related to emancipation, which is that right um, for so long people have found relief. Um, black people and white allies have found relief in these like you know, minute steps toward this human right of freedom, which is also something that's like kind of really messing with my head right now as we're talking about it too, right? That somebody grants you your freedom that supposedly everyone is born with, right? Um, right? And so there hasn't been in this country a reckoning with uh, slavery or everything that has um, come after it and we're seeing some of those things happening right now right and there's like with I mean there's a ton of white backlash around it right like black lives matter blue lives matter right that's from white people 
um, regardless of what race the police officers are. Um, and then, you know, people are pulling down statues and monuments, and now Trump wants to jail them for a minimum of 10 years and has given the FBI permission to arrest them and go after them and find them, right? Like, that is a backlash, and that is a backlash of the highest level, right, of the highest system um, in this country. Other backlashes include, you know, in Rome, Georgia, a couple weeks ago, the Klan marching and the police protecting their march, or counter-protesters, um, white people showing up with Confederate flags and guns to Black Lives Matter rallies. Um, those are things around, you know, white backlash. Or when we talked about some of the protests, uh, some of the COVID protests, right, as we're talking about who the essential workers are and who we're trying to protect in this country, mm-hmm. that could also be potentially considered white backlash, right, right to the s- states and countries being closed down. Yeah. And again, to take that same thing and contextualize it in, um, in the 60s and 70s, right, the 70s, there was a white backlash to the progress of the 60s right and it was again the same general southern population with support from like other you know parts of the nation um but you know southern republicans or who became southern republicans because there were formerly dis formerly southern democrats who felt abandoned by the party which had become the party of civil rights um their backlash manifested in like tough on crime legislation, yeah. right? And it manifested in a lot of these statues. A lot of the statues that are going now, mm-hmm. going down now, were erected yeah. in response to the um, the civil rights movement. Yeah. Not after the Civil War, right? Like decades later, hundred years. Yes. Later. Yeah. And that's not to say that every single one, right? Of course, there were some that you know were erected, right? The one in a uh, What's that place? Oker Cemetery. Mm. The tallest monument there, I think it goes back to like 1920s or something. Uh, But yeah, like a vast majority of these, you know, I guess I wonder when Mount Rushmore, oh, that, that's, well, that's a different kind of, it's a different kind of fucked up. Yeah. But like Stone Mountain, Mm -hmm. you know, that feels pretty modern. A Mm. lot of these were erected as a direct retaliatory response reflexive response to the civil rights movement Mm -hmm. and when you think again about like what is the thing that these people white people feel threatened by like what is it substantively that they feel threatened by because again we're looking at the history and we're saying okay this is the ideal and this is where we make it to you know like we always fall super short of these ideals um, which is why we're still contending with racism, mm-hmm. which is why we're still contending with sexism, with classism, transphobia, transphobia homophobia, mm-hmm. like all of these things. Because, I mean, the, the interest convergence theory doesn't apply just to race, right? It applies to all of those things that we just mentioned. And again, interest convergence theory presumes that not only do we have to wait until the interests of the disenfranchised are converged with the interests of the those in power, but we can also assume that those in power will immediately and, you know, like, yeah, I mean, they'll immediately make concessions, right? Abrogate is the word that Bell uses to, um, to the policies that they make in, you know, insofar as they challenge power, right? So like, why can't we, you know, it's not just that, oh, okay, now it's in your interest and in my interest to abolish prisons, right? It's like, uh, okay, um, I recognize that abolishing prisons will challenge uh, my whiteness in this way, this way, this way, this way. So I'm going to condemn the idea of prisons and, you know, break the ones or repurpose existing prisons into really nice, Mm -hmm. cushy uh, rehabilitation centers that employ the same staff and, you know, the exact same laws around them, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, that way we get to still have prisons. That way we can still not deal with society's problems. We can still invest all of this money into these institutions and people will be happier that we made progress, right? 
it's a whole way of looking at progress in this teolo- teleological sense mm-hmm. that I mean, it's just really exhausting. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's a, you just outlined really well how the systems are working, how they were designed and they're working very well, right? Like it's just an, an evolution, right? Like the prison industrial complex is an evolution of slavery, right? Like slavery didn't, uh, it wasn't abolished, it just evolved. And it's, um, again, like I want to bring back in the political piece that it spans parties, right? I mean, like we just watched the Democratic establishment support Joe Biden, who is literally for nothing. He has no platform other than not being Donald Trump. And the reason that it's so maybe so much more disappointing or so much more apparent is because they talk about being the party for progressives and for change, right? right? I mean, like the Republican party talks about being conservative and they're pretty clear about their values. So there's not really an expectation that they're going to do something different. But over and over and over again, the Democratic party does that. And today they're supporting Amy McGrath instead of Booker in Kentucky and a hotly contested primary to see who can try and kick Mitch McConnell out of office. Um, For those of you who don't know, Mitch McConnell is the incumbent Republican uh, representative senator um, in Kentucky. He's the current Senate majority leader. And and he's a real big shitbag. Right. He's responsible for, um, he's probably the second most or the first most, he alternates with Trump, uh, devastating Republican in... um, the higher orders of American politics today. He pretty much like bills go through him. He's the one who decides what makes it out of the Senate and what doesn't make it out of the Senate. Um, and he was, yeah. So like judges, right. court judges, right. all those things. Yeah. So yeah. it's really important for in a political, like progressive sense to get him out of office. But, um, Amy McGrath is the uh, establishment Democratic candidate who is receiving all the support from establishment Democrats. Mm-hmm. She's um, as Democratic as Joe Biden. Right, right. That will mean different things to different people. <laughs> yeah. And then there's Cory Booker, who's as Democratic as... AOC. AOC. There we go. Right. And he's the, he's the progressive Democratic challenger, primary challenger to Amy McGrath. And the point is, one of them is going to win... And then the one who wins will be able to challenge Mitch McConnell. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's contentious is because, um, I mean, Booker's got a lot of support because a lot of people are ready for change. They're ready Mm -hmm. for someone who has ideas that impact them, that they feel invested in, and they want to see that happen, right? It's very similar to Bernie Sanders' situation. But the money is going towards Amy McGrath. The political um, machine wants Amy McGrath to be the candidate. Thing is, if she's the candidate, right, she's not very inspiring. She's not very convincing as far as being for the people. She's probably not going to beat Mitch McConnell, right? And it almost begs this question of like, you know, is the Democratic establishment trying to help Mitch stay in power? Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, one of the things about, right, rising that I think is really nice is that they really do a good job of painting how the machine, the political machine, right, on the Democratic and the Republican side functions really well to raise money without doing anything you know mm-hmm. like it's become i think you know Sauter put put it um the machine right like they prefer to not have to do anything because when they have to do when they're obligated to make laws to pass laws to do stuff um i mean it's just like that's right. Happens. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, right? Like, it's a much more vulnerable position to be right. in to stand on your platform and to try and create change, right? right? Than to just sit back and be like, oh, yeah, things are working. A lot of people are upset, but they're also used to being upset in this right. way. So we'll just keep it like this, right? right? And so it's, um, you know, it's one of those pieces around this like performative change and that like things that aren't really substantive. You know, like the de- that the Democratic Party constantly engages in with their narrative around, well, like we just have to beat Trump as if Trump is, you know, the main problem and not a symptom of basically all of the racism that we just outlined um, for the past, you know, couple hundred years. Um, yeah. So one question, I mean, that I kind of have for y'all, if you want to put it in the comments or whatever, 
Um, don't forget to like, subscribe, and you know, share this video. But this question on the issue of interest convergence, Bell frames it as a dilemma. You know, like it's a problem that my interests and the interests of my people as a group can only be sincerely, not even sincerely addressed, but like considered for addressal when they converge with your interests, right? If we're all Americans, that shouldn't happen. If we're all identifying as a certain identity, that shouldn't be the case. We should all just be able to see this. So like, how do you propose overcoming um, the dilemma of interest convergence, you know? Um, and then also keeping in mind, right, the intersectional element of it, it doesn't just apply to race, it applies to a whole bunch of things. So essentially, you keep in mind who the um, prime stakeholder and in interest is, and in this country, it's, it tends to be wealthy white men. How do your, like, what needs to happen in order for them to feel invested in your interest, right? You think back, as, you know, again, as the stuff we covered, War is a major impetus, right? In general, no one likes to have war transpire on their own territory or with their own people. Uh, so we think about that as an impetus for like prime ground to have your interests converge. But, you know, insofar as also, you know, like I'm anti-war thoroughly. Um, so I don't think that needs to factor into you know, my personal calculus as far as you know interest convergence short of war short of like mass violence what needs to happen in order for people to feel invested in your cause right like in order to share right this is that thing about allyship again you know like allyship versus white or allyship as white saviorship yeah. um if you can't see your common struggle then i mean then it's not going to work out right that's an interest convergence thing right that's where I thought you were going with your question, which is how do you see your struggles and the struggles of others and how do they, how and where and when do they converge with each other right. and how do you recognize other people's struggles? So now you've got two questions. <laughs> yeah. There's a great quote that uh, I think sums up some of what you were saying by Lilla Watson who said, if you have come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Right? There's a, um, a partnership and an understanding that without others being free, then we ourselves cannot also be free. Right. I think that provides a really great guidepost um, for understanding how to circumvent this idea of interest convergence, or right, rather the major dilemma, because the major dilemma of interest convergence is that this group of people in power doesn't see how it's in their interest to advocate for this group of people that's not in power. Yeah. And if we could all see, I mean, that our struggles are common, right? That like, at the very least, if my not advocating for this group of people is going to lead to major consequences that I can't necessarily foresee down the road, you know, I have to uh, anticipate that and take that into account, right? That's the bare minimum self-interest way to conceptualize that. So, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good, great quote. I think you sent it to me and every time I see it or every time I think about this, especially recently, it, it, it comes up. Yeah. I want to give a shout out. I mean, it seems like we're kind of wrapping up, but I was thinking a lot about what you said before about the folks who are like gain some relief and are pleased and kind of stop their work once there's some sort of acknowledgement of the injustice and some sort of like performative or um, superficial uh, acknowledgement of the injustice. And so I just want to shout out to all the people who are still fighting in the streets, fighting in the courts, who are making phone calls, who are still really active um, in the uprising and the revolution that is happening, um, who have seen past, you know, the performative pieces. And I would encourage all of you to continue to figure out how you can stay involved over the long haul, right? There are immediate things that you can do now. Um, and there's lots of things that you can do on a regular basis to stay involved. We need you. Everyone needs you. Right.
It's a human struggle. Um, like we said, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to this podcast. Comment your answers, your responses to those questions below. Kudos to you if you made it this far. I think given our you know, current view record, probably only like four people <laughs> <laughs> will ever make it this far. But, you know, congrats. We appreciate you. Yeah, super appreciate you. <laughs> um, yeah, and see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.